As we begin this next chapter, chapter 16, on thermochemistry or thermodynamics, the first part of this lecture outline tonight will be a review of concepts that you've learned earlier in the year. So have your PowerPoint notes ready to fill in blanks as needed on your yellow PowerPoint sheets. Um, the new concept that you'll be learning in this PowerPoint tonight or this podcast is about how you can quantify the amount of heat that flows when hot objects cool off or cool objects warm up. So let's go ahead with our definition. Energy is the ability to do work or produce heat or to do both, actually. Energy comes in two forms. You've already learned about the energy of position or potential energy. Now, as we'll understand later in this chapter, energy can also be stored as potential energy in chemical bonds. If you look at a roller coaster ride, you're at your highest potential energy at the top of one of the scary bumps on the roller coaster. There are a couple of PowerPoint, uh, excuse me, a couple of uh, movies that are embedded in this PowerPoint. So I'm going to skip ahead on this one because it's not linked and I don't know that it's necessarily appropriate. And so we're going to come to another example of potential energy. The water stored behind the gates of a dam is considered potential energy until it's released and allowed to turn the turbines of a hydroelectric generating plant. When the dam opens, it does work by turning the turbines, and now that potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. So the second form is the energy of motion, and <clears throat> I just would like to point out <laughs> We do have it spelled correctly this year. Okay. The potential energy of the damned water is converted to kinetic energy as the gates are opened and the water flows out. Okay, so chemical systems contain both types of energy. And you've already learned as temperature increases, that's what our definition of temperature is. It's the um, average kinetic energy. And so that will be increasing with increasing temperature. The potential energy depends upon the chemical composition, such as the type of atoms that are joined in the substance, the number of them and the types of chemical bonds, and particularly how they are arranged with each other. You also learned that there is the law of conservation of energy. You can either create or destroy energy. If you had a bank account, you could transfer perhaps um, money between your savings and your checking account, but the total amount of your money would stay the same, assuming you don't make some major withdrawal. <clears throat> the law of conservation of energy then states that in any chemical reaction or physical process, energy can be converted from one form to another, but it is neither created nor destroyed. So that energy stored in a substance because of its composition is referred to as chemical potential energy and it plays an important role in chemical reactions. Now we're going to talk about measuring heat and the first thing we want to do is make sure you do not confuse the words heat and temperature. They are related, they are not the same thing. Temperature of course is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the random motion of the particles in a substance. The higher the temperature you can assume the higher average kinetic energy that those molecules or atoms have. Heat, however, is a measure of the total amount of energy that gets transferred from an object of high temperature to one of low temperature. So let's talk about that transfer, <clears throat> because in tomorrow's lab, you will be actually taking a hot object and using it to cool, uh, to warm up two other objects that previously were cool, and in the process, be able to quantify <clears throat> the amount of heat that flowed, as well as something called the specific heat capacity. So here's a, f a f couple of dumb questions. Um, would a teacup at 70 degrees Celsius and a bathtub at 70 degrees Celsius, are they at the same temperature? And of course the answer is yes. But if my second question is, which one contains more heat? I'm hoping you chose the bathtub. And the thing that's be different between the teacup and the bathtub full of hot water, let's say, is that the bathtub has more mass. So that's one of the important things to remember is the amount of heat that you can have transfer. By the way, that hot bathtub isn't going to spontaneously cool off or heat up. It's going to cool off. Hot things in the universe get cooler. 
Um, but as I started to say, <clears throat> that amount of heat that's in that bathtub is larger than the heat that would be contained in the cup of uh, teacup of water because the amount of water is greater. So as you notice in this picture, object one is hotter, object two is cooler, and that's the direction that heat flows. Now the funny thing is sometimes we use the letter Q to stand for heat. So the change in heat is something equal to the change in temperature times this little letter C, it's called heat capacity. Now heat capacity is the total amount of heat in that specific mass of a substance. <clears throat> What we're going to look at is something called the specific heat capacity, but before we can do that, we need to do a review of units of um, heat itself. Now, a very common non-metric unit is the calorie. It's defined as the amount of heat needed to take one gram of water and get it hotter by one degree Celsius. That's abbreviated with CAL, or sometimes small letter C. The unit that we use in the metric system, however, is called the joule, and it's about mm, a quarter of a calorie, or another way to say it, it would take a little over four joules to equal one small letter C calorie. Here are some of the relationships between those. Of course, if you put a kilo in front of calories or a kilo in front of joules, then you're going to have a thousand calories or a thousand joules. Now that little letter C calorie isn't the same as the word calorie that you see on food packaging, but let's come back to that concept in a little bit. So here is a picture showing that this very nutritional breakfast would have 230 big letter C nutritional calories. So I guess because it's a little bit too scary, the big capital C calorie that you would see on the side of a food package is really 1,000 of the little chemistry calories with the small letter C. So that's an important thing to know from the beginning. It looks a little scary though if you said there were 230 calories per serving. It's a lot less frightening to say that that's 230 instead of 230,000. So I don't know why nutritionists did that, but just be aware of it. But if you were asked to convert that to joules, Notice that you have to turn your big capital C calories into little calories, times it by a thousand, and then take that 2.3 times 10 to the fifth small calories and multiply them by 4.184 joules per calorie, and you could convert that to joules. In European packaging, they show things in joules and kilojoules. In the United States, we're still non-metric, we're on calories. So one calorie is defined as the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Remember, heat and temperature aren't the same. And in water, there's something that's called a specific heat. And specific heats are expressed usually per gram or per some unit of measurement like a mole. So it takes 4.184 joules to take one gram of water and specifically get it hotter by one degree Celsius. <clears throat> so if you can measure the change in your degree Celsius and you know the mass of your water, you can calculate how much heat must have flowed in or out as it heated up or it cooled off. Remember, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws that govern the universe say that hot things get cooler Heat always flows from places that are hotter to places that are colder in the universe. So that's what specific heat capacity is. It's a little letter C. It is a physical property, not a chemical property. For a pure substance, it is a constant. It's very low in metals, and in water, it's very high. Metals having a low specific heat capacity explains why we use pots and pans made out of metal to cook in. What it means is that per gram of metal, it doesn't take much heat coming from your burner <clears throat> or your electric range top to get one gram of that metal hotter by one degree Celsius. And since that doesn't take much heat, that it transfers the metal of the pot to the foodstuffs and such you're cooking. The specific heat capacity, more importantly, unites the flow of heat with the change in temperature and allows us to calculate a change in heat. Here is the equation that we will use, but I want you to write in your notes right now, you can only use this equation 
when there is no change in phase. This equation only works when the substance that's heating up or cooling down is just heating up or cooling down. It's not melting, it's not freezing, it's not boiling, it's not vaporizing, it's not condensing. And the equation is quite simple. Q stands for heat. Uh, it really means heat um, <clears throat> under certain pressure conditions, but for right now, you can use the letter Q or the letter H to stand for heat. In our context, at a constant pressure in our chemistry lab, those two terms are interchangeable. Of course, you know that delta T stands for the change in temperature. The mass must be in grams, and you must express your specific heat in either joules or kilojoules or calories or kilocalories per gram degrees Celsius. Seems like a funky unit, but it makes all the other units cancel out to get the one number and unit that you are looking for appropriate for that measurement. So if there are four values in this type of equation, three you would know or calculate, and the fourth one you'd find through simple algebra. Delta T, of course, is your temperature of final minus initial. So for example, if you were asked how much heat energy would you absorb if you drank a cup of hot tea, if that tea weighed 200 grams, and we can pretend that the tea is water, and you take your body temperature from, let's say, in the, excuse me, the water temperature starts at 65 degrees Celsius, and by the time it loses heat to your body, it now will have 37 degrees Celsius as its final temperature. Notice that the specific heat, and sometimes expressed as C with a little p for at a specific pressure, the specific heat for water is it takes 4.18, really should be a 4 there, 4.184 joules to get a gram of water hotter by 1 degree Celsius. So what we need to know is our delta T. We've got a final temperature and a starting temperature. We have a mass of 200 grams and we've been given the specific heat of water. Notice that the temperature is technically described as final minus initial. And the reason why we do that is because positive or negative signs will show if heat is being lost or heat if, be, if heat is being gained. So in this particular case, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times the mass times the change in temperature gives me a final value of negative 23,430 joules. Now what that means though in heat measurement is you need to change that into kilojoules because that is the unit that we use for heat. Notice that it's a negative number and what that means is that the hot tea cooled off and gave its heat to the person's body. Those problems are just that simple. So what we've learned is energy can be converted into other forms. We can measure changes in heat energy, but what we need is a device that you'll use in the lab tomorrow called a calorimeter. It's used to measure heat energy because it acts like a thermos or an insulator. It keeps the heat changes that you're studying confined within this little system, and it doesn't allow for any error with heat either being picked up from the environment or lost in the environment. And now we've learned that the change in heat, when something is not changing phase, but when something is just heating up or cooling off, we need to know the delta T, the mass, and the specific heat. So far we've just been using water, but each individual pure substance has its own unique specific heat. And that will be the focus of your lab tomorrow. You're going to find the specific heat of two different metals. So let's take a look at this process by which we can measure heat. This is a kind of calorimeter called a bomb calorimeter. It kind of looks like the one that we'll be using, except what makes the one we're using tomorrow is it doesn't have this little electrical spot right here. We're not going to have any fancy electronics. We'll have a cup with an inner cup, and that ring supports the inner cup from the outer cup and separates it by a cushion of air, which acts as an insulator. And our lid will just be a simple lid with a cap on it. But this kind of calorimeter, you can actually spark some electricity through those electrodes and maybe, say, burn a food item like a peanut or something to see how much heat energy 
which could then be turned into calories, is released when we metabolize foods. So what you have to have, though, is water air there to absorb any heat that's given off. It has to be a known mass of water so that we can use the mass times the change in temperature times the specific heat of water to find the heat that might be released by a chemical reaction. So that's a bomb calorimeter. This is a picture of our calorimeter. We will be using all of these items today except we don't have a wood cover, ours is plastic. And you won't be needing a stirring rod. Tomorrow you're going to take the whole apparatus and sort of swirl it so that you can get the water to mix. And that cross section shows how we have a layer of air that insulates the inner cup, the system, from the surroundings. And we won't have metal fragments, you're going to have an actual chunk <clears throat> of copper or lead or brass. Now the very important next law of the universe is if something is losing heat, something else must be gaining heat. <coughs> I will pick up on this calculation tomorrow, but for each part of this lab that we're going to be doing, you can substitute in the M times C times delta T. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes it said C times M times delta T. The order is irrelevant. Total heat lost equals heat gained. So in our lab, you'll be taking a boiling hot piece of metal. You're heating it in a water bath separate from your calorimeter. You're going to put that hot metal into the calorimeter cup, which will have some water in it. So the metal will cool off, and the water and the cup that holds it will warm up. And you can actually substitute in one of these MC delta T's, or delta T times M times C. And the little letters below it stand for this. So for example, the metal cooling off, its heat would be equal to its change in temperature of the metal times the mass of the metal times the specific heat of the metal. It's probably simpler if you don't include that little P there. Now the heat that the metal lost is equal to the heat gained by the water, and the water could have an M times C times delta T to calculate the heat that it gained, and the little letter C here, just to make it more confusing, stands for the calorimeter, which also, since it holds the water, absorbs its own precise amount of heat. You will be taking a series of measurements tomorrow that allow you to find eight of the nine values that you see in that temporarily scary looking equation. You'll know eight of them, you'll find the fourth one using basic algebraic skills, and you will be able to calculate the specific heat of a specific metal. How much heat would it take to get one gram of that metal hotter by one degree Celsius? Now we'll have a chance to practice this on a worksheet as well as an opportunity to do it four times because you'll be doing two trials per each particular metal. Another lab we'll be doing next week will use nesting styrofoam cups as calorimeters and in that one we'll actually be conducting a particular chemical reaction. Not, a, not just a warming up or cooling up process but a chemical reaction. That makes a good stopping point to introduce tomorrow's lab and I will see you then.